Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mm -hmm. And welcome to the next edition of our guest speaker series here at the Holland Land Office Museum. I want to thank you all for coming out on this wonderful evening. It's nice and warm in here, so we'll stay yeah, nice and dry. Uh, so uh, our speaker tonight is Ken Slagenhoff. I had to ask you know, how to pronounce the name so I didn't butcher it. So. Uh, but he is going to be talking about something very familiar here with this building, the Holland Survey. And so we're going to uh, get another sense of some of the history connected directly with our building here and the people that operated here. Uh, so Ken, feel free. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is a little disconcerting to be in the Holland Land Survey office to talk about the Holland Land Survey. <laughs> I kind of feel like uh, might be a prophet in, my, in the wrong community. However, I am a licensed land surveyor and uh, I want to give you a little bit of background to understand why this is of interest to me is I decided to be a land surveyor when I was 11 years old. It was a rash, um, juvenile, silly decision, but it has served me well so far. Um, I was an only child. Uh, in the late 1950s, I get ready to build the Niagara Power Project. I lived on a house right on the banks of the Niagara River. And I was walking down the riverbank one day and found three guys, this funny looking tripod, and asked them what they were doing. And long story short, is I just made a paint and deck of myself to these people. I spent the entire summer following them around and showing them where the paths were in the playground of my youth. <laughs> and as a result, I made this silly decision that here are three grown men making a living in my playground. I'm going to be a surveyor. And uh, it was funny because um, when I got ready to graduate from Lukeport in June of 1964, a guy walked into an office in Niagara Falls to get some papers notarized, and the notary happened to be my aunt. She signed her name, and he says, "No, it's Slogan. You know Kenny?" He says, "Yeah, it's my nephew." He says. You wouldn't believe it, he spent an entire summer with my survey crew. <laughs> so the guy who had been the party chief of that survey crew was now running the survey business. Long story short, I got a phone call the Monday after I graduated from Newport. I went to work for him, and uh, I guess the rest of it is just history. I like to say the land surveying as a profession is one of the finest in the world if you fit into these categories. Number one, you've got at least marginal mathematic skills. You need to know trigonometry and algebra. Number two, you've got to like history. Because the modern surveyor today does very little original work. We're, our job is to retrace those surveyors in history who have done the work before us to get back to what the original what intent was. And you should also like to solve puzzles. And I love to do all those things. And if you like that, and you like to be in different locations, and sometimes inside, sometimes outside, land surveying is a fantastic um, thing to do. Today we're going to talk about land surveying um, that I'm a little bit jealous about, because it's land surveying of a blank canvas. Western New York, from the Genesee River to the Niagara River, in the period of time that the Holland Land Survey was done, was wilderness. It was the wild, wild west in many, many ways. And so we're going to take a look today as to how that came to be. But before we do, if I can get this thing to work. There you go. I have three people that I'd like to thank um, for some of the background information. One is uh, Francisca Saffron. Uh, Francisco was at the State University of New York in Fredonia. And she actually put together a project where she brought back a lot of the Holland Land Survey records from of all places, Holland. Can you mention that? They were there. Wow. Uh, they didn't all come back, but we have got copies of them. She's got a very great uh, um, system set up. She is long. She's passed now, but uh, her work serves us all very well. Uh, the second is John McIntosh, and Diane here has worked with John. Uh, John is a past president of the New York State Land Surveyors Association, a very well-known surveyor from Lockport, New York, and I've referred to his book entitled "Where Was Joseph Ellicott." And what was he doing after the signing of the Treaty of Big Tree? Yeah. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. And the third person, George Miller, he was an author of a POB uh, Point of Beginning article, which is a professional surveyor's magazine, entitled The Holland Land Company Survey. 
June 1997. You didn't know about that one. So what am I looking at here? Anybody recognize this? Yeah. It's your home state. This is the state of New York. I think this is dated about 1757. This is the Hudson River, the Mohawk River, Finger Lake regions. What's listed here is Kedraquina Lake is now Lake Ontario. St. Lawrence River coming down this way. This is the Niagara River with the falls very conveniently in Youngstown. <laughs> but they did get Long Point in Lake Erie. But in 1757, people hadn't really walked it. They're, they're, ta they're talking to voyagers and fur traders and they're trying to get an idea for what's going on. All of these little dots here, by the way, are communities of Native Americans, 1757. Here's something that looks a little more familiar. This is a map uh, in 1796, and it's important for a couple of reasons, and I want to kind of just point some things out here. First of all, um, you see this line right here. This is the first map that had the proposed boundary between the United States of America and British territories appended. Now, to set the stage for understanding what Western New York was like in this period of late 1700s, early 1800s, George Washington defeated Cornwallis in 1783 at Yorktown, right? Shortly thereafter, there was a Treaty of Paris signed. However, Fort Oswego and Fort Niagara were occupied by the British Army until 1797. 83 to 97, 14 years called the holdover period. And during that period of time, um, it, we were pretty well settled up as far as Geneva, New York. Beyond Geneva, it got pretty sparse. There may have been a few suburbs here in Batavia, uh, but nobody was building any highways, roads, it was, it was wilderness. In order for a citizen of the United States to travel in western New York, they had to have a letter signed by the British officer giving them permission to do so. Now think about what that does to your psyche, having won the war, and yet you have to have permission of a foreign entity. Now the reason was, the British were trying to establish a line here for the boundary between the countries. And so they refused to leave. The second, the second part of that story was all of the loyalists to Great Britain, who after Cornwallis left, fled to Canada, they lost their property and the British wanted them to be reimbursed. The problem is, we were broke. Federally, statewide, there was no money. There was nothing to be done there. But this holdover period is just part of what was going on. So the other thing about New York, Western New York particularly, it was dense forest. Native American trails, waterways, and waterways were the primary way to get goods and people into a community. So naturally, as New York was settled, it began down here in Long Island and Manhattan and that lower part of uh, the Hudson Valley, and as time goes by, on uh, up the Hudson to the Albany area, into Lower Adirondacks, then along the Mohawk, gets into Oneida Lake, and then you've got this. There's no large waterway in the body of New York to take goods across. So what we had to do was to go through Oneida Lake to the Oswego River and back into Lake Ontario in the vicinity of Fort Oswego. Then we could take boats, we could go to the mouth of the Niagara River, and they could get as far as Lewiston, which happens to be my, my little town, and Lewiston from the late 1700s to 1825 was the port of entry for Western New York. Everything that went through Western New York to go to create Detroit, Cleveland, Green Bay, all of those cities came through Lewiston, New York. It was a crucial point. And the problem, of course, of New York was there was this little thing called Niagara Falls. 
and they hadn't found anyone to roll up Niagara Falls. So we had the portage around Niagara Falls, and it was a very, very important, um, I mean, the Native Americans fought over it, then the French came in, the British, and the Americans ultimately, a lot of people died to control what was going on around Niagara Falls. But anyway, once they got the goods by boat to Lewiston, they could come back in from the west to the east a little bit. Now, here's a thing called the preemption line. It goes down through the Finger Lakes. In order to get to the point where we can survey this wilderness, there are certain legal issues have to be resolved. And one of them was caused by the kings of England. In 1620, King James I granted to the Plymouth Company, now that's Boston, Massachusetts, the Plymouth Colony, a tract called New England, which extended west to the Pacific Ocean. James didn't know what that meant, but that's what he did. And then later in 1691, they limited the north and south limits by latitudes. Then 43 years later, King Charles I, not Charles III, granted to the Duke of York from New York City and Albany, the province of New York extending northward to Canada, bounded east by a line 20 miles east of the Hudson River, but no western limit mentioned. What this means is the Plymouth Colony has a right to own western New York, and New York has a right to own the western New York. And so this problem had to be resolved. <coughs> so it was resolved <coughs> in kind of an interesting way. In uh, the Land Ordinance Act, I think it's in 1785, was passed. And this defined the process of surveying public lands going forward. The colonies, the 13 colonies, were, when they were broken up, people came in and took their land with doing tomahawk claims. They go up to a tree and they put a mark on it, and they, they just go around a piece of land with tomahawk markings, and that would become their property. And over the years, it became settled, and they got deeds, and so on and so forth. But that's what's known as kind of a meets and bounds. It's kind of an unusual, irregular way to survey lands. In 1785 or 87, the Land Ordinance Act, designed by Thomas Jefferson, created a way of surveying using due north-south lines and subdivided by due east-west lines. The Holland Land Survey was the first practical demonstration of that system, and every other state has now followed that with prime meridians and systems of this way. So the Holland Land Survey uh, deserves a pat on the back for going in and taking on uh, a new system and making it work, and Joseph Ellicott did a great job with that. Um, now, <clears throat> let's talk about the six million acres of land that was essentially left in western New York at the end of the Revolution. Um, the, la the, the settlement of the preemption question was resolved in Connecticut when they gave Massachusetts the right to sell the land. But once the land was sold, it came under the jurisdiction of the state of New York. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Massachusetts is the entity that begins selling land, and they sold it to one great big chunk, about six million acres, to Nathaniel Gorham and Oliver Phelps. They were supposed to make regular annual payments and in 1790, they were unable to do that, and they had to release two-thirds of that, or about four million acres, back to Massachusetts. So that means that of that six million acres, the easterly two million acres was what we call the Phelps and Gorham Purchase. 1791, a fellow by the name of Robert Morris, which was a very interesting guy. He was a land speculator, had been all his life. He was very wealthy when the um, Revolution broke out. He was known as the financier of the American Revolution. Whenever they needed to find some way to get arms, food, shelter, whatever for the uh, Continental Army, it fell to Morris to do that, oftentimes with his own money, but he also was very good at getting into other people's money. Um, 
Morris wanted to be made whole, and he come forward and he bought from Massachusetts that remaining four million acres of land. Later that year, uh, he sold four of the tracts to six Dutch banking houses. Now the Dutch, at the bequest of John Adams, had been also involved in our revolution in terms of providing some financing. They kind of backed us financially in the revolution, taking a, 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 a risk that we would be successful, and in fact we were. So these uh, Dutch bankers um, bought four of the tracks. They then bought more land in New York and in Pennsylvania, and in 1795 they formed the Hollandesh Land Company, which we now know as the Holland Land Company, and we're in their office right now. So this is kind of like the beginning of the chain of title for all the land that we own here in Western New York. It's a copy of the deed signed by Robert Morris. Now, another problem had to be solved. That very first map I showed you with all those little dots, Native Americans all over the state of New York. Yeah, sure, I'm going to buy four million acres of land from you, but what about the Native Americans? Morris was required to resolve their ownership to refine and define that ownership before they could go ahead with the deal. So they had the Treaty of Big Tree in September 1797. There were 3,000 Senecas present. That's a pretty good sized committee. Big committees like that don't work. It was in Geneva. So um, he did get it settled after uh, a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The natives received $100,000 in a trust fund, which was a lot of money in 1797, and approximately 200,000 acres of land in the, in the realm of reservations in the state. So these reservations were exclusions to the Hollow Land Survey. So they became the very first thing the Hollow Land Survey had to get settled. They had to go to where the Native American, where the descriptions were, and work with the tribe to settle those lines and get them um, completed. <coughs> this is a rough sketch where they're showing some of the reservation lines that they were going to propose. And it took some <coughs> time to get it done, but they ultimately did do it. This is a more modern map where you see Tonawanda. Um, that's Buffalo Creek, I think, yeah. Cataraugus, Salamanca. There were, uh, I think, a, a num nine or ten uh, reservations set out at the Garneau Plateau where Mary Jameson was on um, the Genesee River. So that was a job unto itself, where they had to get those lines in. And the guy who was chosen was Joseph Ellicott. Now, I know that you know an awful lot about this guy. Um, he was chosen lead surveyor. He brought his brothers, Andrew and Benjamin, in. Um, they were very experienced land surveyors. They had been working on the layout for the uh, city of Washington, D.C. Uh, Andrew was uh, capable of making transits. He could build a transit. They weren't easy to come by. But he had the skills to use the brass to actually make a transit. And a transit is, is different than a, you know, start with a compass with a jake staff. Um, but a transit needs to be able to have a cross here on it and be able to go back and forth like this because the transit is used to sight the North Star. And that's a very interesting thing that they did during the Hall of Land Survey. Sighting the North Star is, um, well, if you were to do it today, and nobody ever does it now because of GPS, but I actually did do that in my career down in Jamestown on a hilltop, January, clear night, because you guys have clear night, probably minus 15 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of fun. Um, and, and the North Star, of course, is this, the one star that is closest to the line formed between the North Pole and the South Pole, the axis of rotation for the Earth. But if you look at it in a transit with crosshairs, it's moving. It's constantly making a circle. It's a small circle, but it's making a circle. So if you were to make a Polaris observation today, it's, it's a process where you've got to follow it with the crosshairs. You have an extremely high precision clock used by the U.S. Naval Observatory. And what you do is you, the instrument operator does a countdown. He watches the star, three, two, one, mark when it hits the crosshair. You record the time, 
and then reverse the instrument, you do this like eight or 16 times because it's always got some error. In it. They didn't have a chronometer in 1797 to do that, but they did observe the North Star, and that's a very important part of what they did. So anyway, they had a lot of experience. So right after the Treaty of Big Tree was done, uh, Ellicott began his work. And the first order of business was to define the outer limits of what was there. It's fine to say, well, it's Lake Ontario, the Niagara River, and Lake Erie, and Pennsylvania, but no one had ever measured the actual location of the shore of Lake Ontario. So that was one of the things that I had to do. Um, traversing the mapping the coast of Lake Ontario, the East Bank of Niagara was completed on November 8th of that year. This is the Phelps Gorham Purchase. And this had been occupied prior to the Holland Land Survey. So what that means is this line here pretty much was a division line. It had to be negotiated, but they were beginning up here at a point on Lake Ontario, and then they were going to come out along the lake. Now, these are actual excerpts from his field notes dated October 3rd of 1797. Traverse from a part of the country called West Geneseo. So Western New York was known as the Genesee country, West Geneseo, Hummel Land Survey, Wilderness, you name it, had a lot of different names, but he's calling it West Geneseo. Commencing at the northwest corner of Messrs. Gorham and Phelps Purchase, a chestnut post standing on the beach of Lake Ontario, which is open marsh of about 40 or 50 yards wide, a postmark GP on the east and 28 three quarter mile on the south. Um, he had to meet with Major, I can't think of his first name, but it was Hoops. Major Hoops was the surveyor for uh, Phelps and Gorham. And he took them to the post and they came to an agreement as to where the point of beginning for the survey was going to be. And this is where the property is and that's where the post was found right there. And what they're going to do now, it's hard to see this, but they're going to go from there and they're going to take a survey all the way along Lake Ontario, the Niagara River, and Lake Erie mm -hmm. to Pennsylvania. It's a big job. Big job. So, a um, couple of things to point out here. Number one, that was the point of beginning, but this line, you know this, this little north-south line, this border between New York and Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. Did you understand that that is defined as being a line due south of the most westerly tip of Lake Ontario? Oh, oh my gosh. That's how it was decided. Oh, so Joseph and his crews had to go into Canada over to Hamilton and locate that point to establish a latitude on it so that when they got down here, they knew where that line was supposed to be. Wow. Big job. Wow. Now, we're picking up the notes. Uh, from where we left. Now what he does is, um, he's starting at this post, he occupies this post, and he's using a compass and a chain. A chain is a measurement, 66. Anybody not know what chains are? You probably don't. Little aside, all units of measurement in the English system come from the human body. You got an inch, you got a span, you got a yard. This is the king's nose to the king's hand. Um, and of course a foot. Um, there's an interesting surveying manual written in 1535 that instructs a surveyor how to get the proper length of a rod, which was called a rood back then. And he said what you do is you go down to the church on Sunday morning, you take the first 16 men that come out of church, and you take their left feet and you put them together heel to toe. You put the rod at the heel of one and you cut it off at the toe of the other, and that's going to be a true measurement. The theory being the average of 16 feet pretty gets, gets pretty close to being a standard. Uh, long story short, that became 16 and a half feet. And so if you ever see a road called two rod road, three rod road, yeah. okay, so if it's a two rod road, it's two poles are 33 feet wide. Three rod is 49 and a half. Four rods is a chain that's 66 feet. So a guy named Gunter made the chain, which was 66 feet, and they were quite literally pieces of wire, 0.67 feet long, made digitally so it's 100, it's 100 links in it. So when you read an old deed, it says it's 17 chains, 33 links, 
That's a decimal equivalent, so you can take 17.33 times 66 and come up with the number of feet in it. Okay? Diane's nodding. She's done yeah. that before. <laughs> yeah, not exactly, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh -huh. So anyway, I want you to understand. So what they're doing is they occupy the first post. They put as far out as they can, they put another post in the ground, they take a magnetic bearing to it. And then they measure the distance to it in chains. Then they occupy that point, take another magnetic bearing, go, and they do that all the way along the survey. Okay? Now, as you're going along the survey, he's making notes about what the land is like. So he's saying when he leaves there, he's got a bank four or five feet high and the termination of the marsh. A small marsh back on the beach on the mouth of a small creek at 3.5. That means from his last traverse point, 3.5 chains, he's finding a small creek coming in there. And he says the marsh ends with the course of the bank being four to five feet high. Then he's in the open marsh. And then he says to the mouth of a large creek, of a creek large enough to turn an overshot mill enters a lake at 2.5. That'd be from another traverse point. But what these crews are trained to do while they're doing the survey is they're recording what kind of trees are there, what's the soil like, what are the advantages of the land so that the Holland Land Company can decide what's a fair price to get for them. You know, this is a good piece. This is rocky and hilly. We can't really do anything with it. So this is collecting information about the wilderness that people didn't have before. Now, I like this one. To the mouth of the creek large enough to turn the overshot mill enters the lake at 2.50. Land in the creek for half a mile is marshy and no timber. Encamped at this place, about 9 at night, there came out a violent thunderstorm from the southeast with hard wind and rain, probably like tonight. Blew down our tents. The wind, about 12, shifted to the north and blew a gale. Storms of rain continued all night. The sea ran so high that all hands were obliged to turn out to the boat and, of course, suffered both cold and wet. October 4th, laid by all this day, the wind too high to settle the needle. That means the magnetic compass wouldn't settle down, so you can take a reading. Commence the traverse at number 29 to a bank timber with beach and maple. <laughs> this was a hard life. Now, as they were traversing along Lake Ontario, the simplest way to take all their goods and services were on boats along the shore, because they're on the shoreline. So until they got to Wollaston, that's the way that they traveled. But when you have a hard storm like this, these guys are out there trying to save their supplies and everything else, it's kind of a difficult time to exist. Mm -hmm. On the evening of October 5th, this entry appears. In camp for the night and observe the variation which we found to be 3 degrees 10 minutes west and the observation taken half an hour after the polar star passed the meridian going west. This is the first note in the survey that tells me that what they're doing is during the day, it's compass bearing and distance, compass bearing and distance. When they're done, if they get a perfect night, clear night where they can see the North Star, then they take the transit up center over the point and they check the, make the magnetic bearing against the true measure, measure bearing. Does that make sense? This is high precision survey in 1797. It's really something to be amazed with. Now, they can't adjust for what I talked about later, the small variations of the circling. They just don't have the ability to do that. But they can take a shot on, on the North Star, and they do this periodically when the opportunity arises according to the weather. Now, um, I'm not going to go back on this, but I want, I, I, there's another little thing that's got to be resolved, and I, I kind of backtrack into this. In 1763, um, Pontiac and the Senegas got together. There's a whole argument over was this part of Pontiac's rebellion or was it uh, Senegas being angry because they lost their job, portaging things. Doesn't make any difference. The Devil's Hole massacre happened mm -hmm. uh, near Niagara University, Devil's Hole. And a British wagon train was ambushed. <laughs> three, people, uh, three people survived. John Studman, who ran the portage for the British was on horseback and got away. Another man was wounded, got underneath the pine tree and laid still. And a 10-year-old drummer boy was scared so bad he jumped over the precipice into the gorge and the drum strap caught in a tree and saved his life. Those were the only three people that survived. In Lewiston, the British in Lewiston heard that. They came running. By the time they got there, they too got ambushed. It was a nasty mess. So in 1763, that happened. In 1768, Sir William Johnson 
who was the guy who did all of the Indian um, business for the British in New York State and beyond, actually. Uh, took retribution on them and made them give up all right title and interest to land two miles wide on both sides of the Niagara River. So it was a four mile swath from the mouth of the Niagara River um, that they gave up uh, all rights, title, and interest to, including all of the islands, and that would be Grand Island and all the little islands as well. So as a result of the outcome of the revolution then, the state took title of this on the American side, on the, on the US side. And it was resolved down to a one mile wide swath instead of two miles. And so this New York State Mile Reserve was excluded from the Holland Land Survey. So the western limit of the Holland Land Survey is not the bank of the Niagara River. It's a line parallel to it one mile inland, which is roughly where the Niagara Scenic Parkway goes down through. So that had to be resolved too, just like the <coughs> Indian reservations. Um, so in 1798, Seth Pease, surveyor, actually went along the top of the bank, got the line a mile in, and then laid out the mile reserve. This is a copy of his field book. That's his name, Seth Pease, there, the date 1798. This is a copy of his field notes, the eastern boundary of the New York Reservation on the east side of Niagara River, and the way his notes looked. And um, again, these notes, these are from point to point. There's a bearing and a distance. And then at each point, he takes bearings and distances to big trees and landmarks that make sense. And then I'm fascinated by this. This is hand written in the back of every field book that they had. And this is printed in the field book of every land surveyor's office that you'll see today. It's the same collection of formulas mm. and solutions for mathematical problems, and they were doing it back in 1797. Mm. They had all those solutions in there. Mm. These guys were pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. So it was a very serious undertaking, and every contingency had to be considered. Uh, Ellicott in 1797 ordered meat. The pork shall be of merchantable quality, well put up and salted in good, clean, tight, substantial barrels containing 200 neat weight each. There shall not be in each barrel more than three shoulders without legs <laughs> and two heads without ears and snouts. So here's a guy undertaking to survey four million acres of wilderness, and he's also dealing with getting his survey crew, when they were doing the interior work on this, 150 people. And I guess I can get away with saying this, but they were all men. 150 men. Uh, he had people that did a little bit of everything. He had um, probably well over 100 axemen because once they started the straight lines, they cut down all the trees. Cut a straight line on the west of Transit Meridian, starting the Pennsylvania border, due north 88 miles. They cut 66 foot wide swath all the way so they could see, and it would be sort of a mine. So anyway, the food was budgeted for $5,160 and camp supplies was seven hundred or $7,336, including $250 for wine, spirit, and medicine, and that means they're surveyors. I can't have that. Of the 150 men, there were two transit engineers, at least 10 deputy surveyors, axemen, boatmen, store managers, cooks, messengers, and others. Joseph Ellicott made $8 a day. Uh, his brothers did make so much, and I think the men typically made about a buck. The Eastern Transit Meridian was started on June 14th of 1798. Benjamin, his brother, led that effort. He was the party chief, and he took an oath of office to a magistrate to perform his duty truly and faithfully. Now, this is important because Benjamin um, and Andrew and Joseph Ellicott were truly professional surveyors. So this is the east, this this is the the the, the Land Survey, and this is the Eastern Transit Meridian. The Eastern Transit Meridian is the one that was finally settled as being the division point between Phelps and Gorham and what the new lands were going to be. So they set a monument right here on the, on the Pennsylvania New York line, and they started due north until they got right there, and then they had to take a hitch to the west and go on. So here's another thing about land surveying. There is a law that says, 
first in time, wins. So there was an erroneous deed written in the Phelps and Gore purchase that conveyed to another private party this piece of land that technically should have been part of the Home Land Survey. But because he, it, was a, it was a bona fide arm's length transaction, they had to offset their line to go around what was previously owned on the east side of the property. So they took a little hitch over there <coughs> and then went up and, and put that in the ground. That's what I just explained. There is also a western transit meridian. So they put another monument down here and they do they went due north and this western transit meridian I'm pretty familiar with. Uh, John McIntosh was too. This goes right up transit road through Lockport. It's centered on there. Um, but we've had we had some fun with this in the late 1900s. Here's uh, the third page of the Meridian Road uh, notes for the Western Transit Meridian. And here you see it says Pennsylvania. This is the Pennsylvania line. Uh, this is range six, town one, town one, range seven. And this is his line that he's gonna start going now. Uh, interestingly enough, north is to the bottom of the page in this scenario. Hmm. And then every 80 chains or one mile, I put a stone marker in the ground every mile for 88 miles they did that and here you see that they, they talk you know i mentioned to you before that as they do this they're recording what this, the land looks like these are hasher marks they're showing slopes of the mountains they're making comments about the trees the nature of the, of the dirt and soil and it says there's 80 there's a stone monument there and there's a stone monument there every mile all the way up now, here's a, an interesting sketch. This is the Western Transit Meridian begins at a certain stone on the Pennsylvania line being east, six chains, 33 lengths from the 171 milestone of the set line and marked as follows on the east side Hall Land Company. This is a copy of the stone. Now, he had stone masons with him. So they went to a job site, they'd find the proper stone, they'd trim it up, and they would chisel all of this information into the stone. This monument was set on the Pennsylvania line. So the West Transit Meridian started in July 1st of 1799. Now as 1999 approached, several members of the New York State Association of Professional Land Surveyors and the Niagara Frontier Regional, which is the Western New York Regional, took notice and after, you know, an after meeting conference normally happens in what we call a hospitality suite. You know, the day's done, and you're not going to bed yet, so you go have a couple of soda pops and you start talking about things you should do. We decided we needed to go look at this. So we started an inventory of all the members' original monuments that had been recovered through the years, and uh, we began to search for others. Here we are tracing the prior survey. This is the work that the modern surveyor does, is trace the prior work. So the original stone at the south end of the Western Transit Meridian was unknown. A New York State Engineer's Boundary Commission report in 17, or 1897, which was 100 years after it was set, indicated the stone was not recovered at the time. So it had been gone, it hadn't been seen in well over 100 years. In May 29th, 1993, we found it. And Steve Bodecker and Steve Malley, uh, both land surveyors who were with my firm at the time, and their children went out on a weekend and went searching for it. And there it is. All my hands. Uh, it looks just like the sketch. Was it buried? It was not buried. It was, well, uh, let me use Steve's. This is, this is a poster we made of that survey. And um, I'll read this to you. May 29th, the company of Bodecker's two sons and Malley's two daughters hiked in the Allegheny State Park along the boundary line between New York and Pennsylvania, playing hide and seek with a chunk of stone carved and set in the wilderness 194 years earlier. Had not been seen for over 100 years. The initial search, thorough search proved fruitless. The site today is heavily wooded, rocky, and hilly, with much underbrush to deal with. A six-inch square granite marker, that's the 171 marker, was found. 
No success at the line. Malley sat out with a compass due north, and Bo Ducker was the follow line east-west sweep. Steve was ahead with his daughter Katie and my two boys while I was crossing a run line with his daughter Kelly. As I jumped on a follow along, I noticed a large stone underneath. Something told me to look closer. As I began to uncover it, I saw the inscriptions and knew we had found it. It was, it was buried in trees and brush. Um, this photograph okay. is in situ. That's where it was found. 80 feet north of the state line. And that's in a, that's in a Quaker house in Allegheny. It is. I'm going to tell you how it got there. I don't know. Killed a lot of people. Almost. Um, but this is a six foot rule. Gives you an idea of the dimension of it. It's a screwdriver. Um, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is the poster that we did and, and tells the whole story. <laughs> Essentially, once we found that, um, we were working with the State uh, Office of Parks and Historic Preservation, Allegheny Parks people, and so on and so forth. Um, we came to the conclusion that someone had decided that that beautiful marker would look good in their cabin and had taken it and was trying to walk away with it. Uh -huh. Got about 80 feet and decided, I can't do this. So we actually went there, we spent the day where the monument was lying, we took it out and we set a brass disc and we surveyed it in with GPS and then we wrapped the monument in a heavy tarp and with about six guys on both sides of it, we carried it to an ATV and hauled it out and then it got into the museum at Quaker. Actually, it first was on display at Red House. Red House. And then we moved it to Quaker, and the Quaker Museum's never open anymore, so nobody ever gets to see it. It is still there, I saw it. I saw it last summer. Did you, you see it last summer? Yeah. I know it's still there, but the, the, oftentimes the door is locked. So, <clears throat> just give you an idea of what they did. On the, uh, our survey, on the eastern Trans Meridian, the east side, we found original stones at 1 mile, 22 miles, 24 miles, 29 miles, and 30 miles. We mm -hmm. found original stones in place. On the western Trans Meridian, we found the beginning stone to serve and other stones at 6, 45, and 48. In April, we did GPS observations on all of these monuments. So <coughs> GPS is using high precision technique satellite locations, not like what you've got in your car, but high precision stuff, to get the locations. And then we could have, use that location information today to compare to what the original surveyor said it was in terms of bearings and distances. And that's what we did. And I'll show you this in, uh, in more detail in a minute. But this is a sketch uh, that we made with the Eastern Trans of Meridian and the Western Trans of Meridian. And um, I give you an idea. This is the Western Trans of Meridian up here the data. This is the origin to the six mile stone, 45 mile stone, 48 mile. And um, we found the distance, which was supposed to be six miles, was 139 and 17 hundreds of a foot long. Uh, at 45 miles, it was 551 and 56 hundreds of a foot long. Um, we find a lot of fairly significant discrepancies. Now, it's fairly significant in terms of technology today. But when you think about the mountains in Allegheny State Park and climbing over trees that cut down with axes and using a 66 foot long chain to measure distances, try to keep them horizontal, it really isn't bad work. The Eastern Trans Meridian was a little bit better. And I'll, I've got a, here's a better example right here. This is the Western Trans Meridian. Um, the six mile stone, the azimuth from the point of beginning was 359, 58, 39. So it's 360 would be due north, right? Which means that that stone is 12 and a half feet off of a true north side, a true north line from Pennsylvania. Wow, that's... It's not bad. Uh-huh. Not bad. So at 45 miles, so 38 feet off west, and at 48, they were 34 feet west. So that's what we found on the Western Trans Meridian. The eastern trans meridian, one mile, they were only four feet off. It was 3.2 feet west of the meridian. 
Now bear in mind, this is a meridian that we established using geodetic surveying GPS technology. They just sighted the North Arrow when they could, or the, the North Star when they could. At 22 miles, 86 feet short, but exactly north of the monument on the Pennsylvania line. Mm -hmm. 24 is 64 feet short, or 61.5, a foot, in, a foot point eight off. At 29, 17.8, and at 30, 18.4. Long story short, these mm -hmm. guys did a phenomenal job. A phenomenal job. We were, we were really quite impressed. Now, when we look at the excess footage between the miles of the Western Trans Meridian, we had a mismeasurement of one foot for every 480 that they went. So every time we went 480 feet, they had an error, a one foot error. On the Eastern, it was one foot every 2,500. One inch and a half. No, not one inch, it's one foot. One foot. One foot. I see, one, I see a one in. Okay. Oh, it's one in, one foot yeah, in 2,500. So there's quite a difference. And you, you, we start to ask our question, why? Well, um, the Eastern Transit Meridian was performed under the direct supervision of Joseph Ellicott's brother Benjamin, assisted by Augustus Porter from the Porter Barton Company in Lewiston, a very experienced light surveyor. Benjamin took an oath of office to perform the duty truly and faithfully. And his notes state, formed by astronomical observations that began on the 11th day of July with all possible care and exactitude, planting monuments at stone at the end of every 80 chains. The line was the eastern boundary of the Holland Survey and was seriously approached because this was a property line. This was a boundary line. Somebody owned this, Phelps and Warren owned this, HLC was going to own that. Okay? Contrary, the Western Transit Meridian was interior to the survey. Its sole purpose was to provide a guidance line for subdividing the lots in between. So it wasn't meant to be a property line when it was laid out. Um, it was done by Ebenezer Carey, a surveyor from Connecticut. And in his notes, he says, well, here we go again at the outset. <laughs> his job was to carry the survey of the 65 milestone and hand it over. And much of his crew had worked on the eastern fence of Meridian. They remember the swamps, the mosquitoes, the long days of cutting away through uninhabited woods under threat of attack from hostile Indians. They called backbreaking work, interrupted by scant sleep, poor food, sometimes water, unfit to drink. These guys were not as motivated as the first crew. <laughs> and it was, as I say, interior. Therefore, um, it might have been a, a little bit sloppy. Well, it was. It was, a, it was more sloppily done. This is the actual um, starting monument on the eastern transit meridian, and that's the way it looks today. We use a magic marker to color in the, the language, but it's still there. Is that stone available for public viewing, or is it sealed off or not? No, no, you can go to it. The surveyors will work to it, but it's. I've not been to this particular one. I've been to the western transit meridian, but you could walk up to it. Yeah. You probably would need some maps and stuff to guide you. The survey was completed in October 1800. The total cost was $70,921.69 and a half cents. <laughs> <laughs> they did 178 six mile square townships fully laid out, and they collected the details of the surface on land, soils, lumber, creeks, rivers, mill seats. And then they opened up an office, and that's where we happen to be today. Hmm. Joseph Allegat was appointed the resident agent. No one knew the land better than Joseph Allegat. He'd walked over it all. He'd seen it. In 1821, unfortunately, he resigned from his position and in his closing years. He had some mental health issues. And uh, it was a sad story. Now, here's some random images just to show you. This is uh, beginning our work in 1997. Uh, these are two Western Air Surveyors. That's George Miller, who I thanked early on. This is Jim Delaplant. Um, this is in the New York State Archives, looking at the actual records of the Hall Land Survey. This was, uh, we had a family weekend. Uh, we went out there and recovered these things. Uh, kids were having a good time. This is the actual site where we found the Western Transit Meridian. We did a day-long presentation at uh, Red House at the administration building, we 
uh, invited uh, historical associations and other surveyors and realtors and attorneys. And we had modern equipment, we had old equipment, and we showed, demonstrated a chain versus a steel tape versus GPS or EDM measurements. Yeah. We had a really good day doing that. This is the actual observation. Uh, that's Steve Bodecker, he's the guy that found the monument. This is a GPS system over the location of that. The guys, you know, that's a state job. There's four guys talking, one guy working. <laughs> 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 Nothing came flying at me. <laughs> this, I believe, is Bob Schoenfall in McIntosh's office processing the data. That's Bob there. And uh, that's Steve Mallon and Steve Bodecker. And there you see the monument when we had gotten it back to the. That was a big day. And then there's the picture of the oh. original cord. Now, where is that? That is. She. You know, you can all see that. Now. But this is the eastern transit meridian. Yeah. That line is at the south end of that line. The line I'm trying right there. Okay. Okay. The one we found was over here. Oh, all right. So there's two different stones. This right. one was taken out. And we recovered it and marked it. This one is still in place. So the one that's in the center is the one that's right there? Yes. Yeah. And this is the crew. And this idiot with the tie on is me. I don't know why I was dressed up for the day, but I guess I was master of ceremonies or something. You're in charge. Yeah. I am the boss. <laughs> and that's it. So that's my story about, um, you know, Taking really a blank canvas, Western York, four million acres of wilderness, organizing it, uh, inventorying it, and getting it ready for sale. And uh, it was a big job, and uh, I'm really impressed by what they did. So, any questions? Yes. So, on the original survey, there were some errors here and there which can now be corrected using GPS and modern technology. Cannot be corrected. Okay, so you, it stays with what it was per the survey. That's right. Okay. Yeah. In surveying, if you can find monuments, they by law are the original intent of the subdivision. You don't move them just because if if they say that these two stone monuments are due north of each other at exactly so many feet, and you find a different bearing and distance between them, those monuments hold. So if it were, if there were corners of a property, the monuments would hold. You would put the bearing and distance according to the record, and the bearing and distance according to the, what you measured. But you would hold the monuments as the property line. Mm. Okay. So on the Eastern Transit Meridian then, which defined the line between the Holland Company and the Phelps Gore Gore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that actually moved a little bit. Uh, in some cases, as much as five hundred feet. Exactly. And everybody just accepted that as. Yep. That, that's, that's just the way boundary surveying works in your state. Boundary surveying is, most people think if you hire a land surveyor, he's going to come up with the same answer that everybody else does. A, a boundary survey is a professionally prepared opinion as to the location of your described lands on the face of the earth and the improvements on that property with respect to those boundaries. There's no such thing as a perfect measurement. Even the GPS monument measurements here are prob have error in them. Guaranteed they do. There's never been any such thing as a perfect measurement. You get better technologies, get her, and there's the whole question of the difference between precision and accuracy. Um, but you just have to apply your professional judgment as to what the original intent was and go to that. So for better or worse, the original survey is forever. Yes. <laughs> now what, what really gets hairy is when the original monuments are gone. Yeah. And that happens. But that's another whole lecture. You don't want to hear that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do, but we don't. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. The, uh, when was it determined that the magnetic north and uh, the true north uh, we're not the same. Well, magnetic north, interestingly enough, magnetic north moves. Uh, the magnetic 
field of the world shifts periodically. So that when you, when you look at a map and it gives a magnetic declination, it's very important to give you the year of observation for that magnetic declination because apparently it has something to do with the molten core of the Earth, which is oh, I see. fluctuates a little bit. So it, it, sometimes it's west of north, sometimes it's east of north. It might be three minutes, it might be a degree and a half. So you need to know these sorts of things. So we know that magnetic always, and, and magnetic is, if you, if you have a, a, a compass up, and some guy comes up with a shovel and puts it here, then you know, it's gonna go like this. It happens. So it's got all sorts of local fluctuations. It can have iron ore in the ground nearby, which would throw it all off entirely. So we've always known that those discrepancies are there, but, they could only do the survey using what they had during the day, and that was a magnetic compass and chains. But the fact that they checked it against the meridian is, is really a hallmark of really fine professional work. Make sense? <laughs> I'd be glad to answer any other questions you might have. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone again for coming out, and thank you, Ken, for a very enlightening uh, just a quick couple announcements of things coming up. Uh, next Thursday is our next edition of our Java with Joe E uh, morning coffee group. Uh, we have Tom Tiefel, the town of Virgin historian, talking about antique maple syrup making. So uh, definitely appropriate for a morning coffee group for sure. Uh, so that's at 9 o'clock next Thursday. Here. Here. Uh, yes. Uh, then our next guest speaker. I uh, was actually in the audience with us tonight, but uh, Dennis Upton will be playing Joseph Ellicott himself on November 1st, uh, which just happens to be Joseph <coughs> Ellicott's birthday. So <laughs> worked out perfect. So that'll be at 7 o'clock. That'll be a Tuesday night, November 1st. So be sure to come and uh, check that out as we uh, listen to uh, Ellicott in his later years. So uh, that'll be very yeah. cool. And then. Uh, it's already that time of the year. Uh, November 18th is the opening of our Wonderland of Trees, our Christmas tree event. So if you haven't been, be sure to check it out. Uh, the trees will be up through the end of the year. And uh, it's the 21st year we've done it here this year. So we are very excited to uh, bring that back. We'll have live music and great food from the DNR Depot. So be sure to come and check that out. Uh, Everything's on our website, Facebook page. You can even give me a call, and I'll be happy to fill you in on any information. So thank you, everybody. Uh, there's still some cookies and coffee left. Help yourself, but uh, have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, it's a leader right now.